Hello everyone. I hope you've had a good week with lots of smiles and laughs and having fun. So this, the sutta today is called the Kosambians, the Kosambian Sutta. It's number 48. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Kosambi in Gosita's park. Now on that occasion, the monks of Kosambi had taken to quarreling, brawling, and were in deep disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. It sounds like that's what's happening right now with politics a lot, doesn't it? They could neither convince each other nor be convinced by others. They could neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Then a certain monk went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and informed him of what was happening. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come, monk, tell, the, tell these monks in my name that the teacher calls them. Yes, venerable sir, he replied. And he went to the monks and, and told them, the teacher calls the venerable ones. <clears throat> yes, friend, they replied. They went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked them, Monks, is it true that you have taken to quarreling and brought and are in deep disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers? That you could neither convince each other nor be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Yes, venerable sir, they replied. Now, this is what happens when you get an opinion about something and you hold to it no matter what anybody else says. You make it a big deal in your mind and then you start stabbing other people with verbal daggers and making up gossip. This is a big problem that we cause for ourselves by being over opinionated or over attached to a particular idea. To be a true Buddhist means that we can be open to what anybody else says or does, and we can then, if it's about Buddhism, then we can go to uh, the suttas and see whether it's correct or not. But holding on to a view and not listening to anybody else's and talking over them or talking at the same time is a real problem. And this also happens in marriage. When, when there's an argument between one person and another, one tries to talk over the other while, while the other is talking. You can't hear what anybody says when that occurs. What you need to do, this is something that uh, K. Sri Damananda, he was actually quite brilliant in a lot of different ways. 
and married people would come to him for counseling. And he would say, you can't both talk at the same time. Because you know what you said, you don't know what the other person said, and you hold to the view. So he said, one person at a time talks. And this takes the, the bite out of arguments. Now, one of the things that I have a tendency to tell people is that if someone is coming to you, even though it's a family member, you see that they're upset, that they're not happy, then you start radiating compassion to that person. And then their emotional attachment will fade away after a period of time. then you can discuss what the problem is. So this is something about this sutta. Monks on one side of the fence, they said, oh, there was a break in rules and you're so dumb because you don't know the rules and that sort of thing. And the other side said, no, we didn't break any rules. And, and it was just an argument back and forth so much so that they were causing a lot of problems. And they were prob causing the, the people that we, they would go to alms round in some places and they would get those people to take their side and criticize the other side. So it was causing disharmony in the whole village. And this is one of the things that we have to be very cautious about. Monks, what do you think when you take to quarreling and brawling and are in deep disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers? Do you, on the count of the, on that occasion, maintain acts of loving kindness by body, speech, and mind in public? and in private towards your companions in the holy life. No venerable sir. So you can see how they were causing themselves and others around them suffering by holding on to a view too tightly. <coughs> So, monks, when you take to quarreling and brawling and are in deep disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, on that occasion you do not maintain acts of loving kindness by body, speech, and mind in public and in private towards your companions in the holy life. Misguided men. Anytime the Buddha says misguided men, that's really a big slap. What can you possibly know? What can you possibly see that you take to quarreling and brawling and are in deep disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, that you can either neither convince each other nor be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others, misguided men that will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, there are six memorable qualities that create love and respect and conduce to helpfulness, to non-dispute to concord and to unity, what are the six? 
Here a monk maintains bodily acts of loving kindness both in public and in private towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. That means helping each other physically and being careful with your generosity. Too many times generosity is considered only by giving money, but it's giving of yourself to help other people overcome their suffering. Again, a monk maintains verbal acts of loving kindness in public and private towards his companions in his holy life. This is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to happiness and unity. Again, a monk maintains mental acts of loving kindness in public and in private towards his companions in the holy life. This is a memorable quality that creates love and respect and conduces to happiness and unity. Now, maintaining mental acts of loving kindness is also talking about learning and practicing forgiveness meditation. It's amazing how many people come and they start practicing meditation with me and they have something that's really deeply ingrained in them and they're very unhappy. And they tell me that they can't, they can't even feel the warm feeling in the center of the chest. They can't radiate that out. They don't have any feeling. What is the cause of that? The cause of that is old, hard-hearted thoughts and feelings that are wrapped around your heart. Now, when you radiate that, that loving-kindness feeling, it is radiating whether you can feel it or not. But what I tell people to do is practice forgiveness for themselves for making mistakes causing themselves and others harm or disquiet or pain. And you forgive yourself for every thought that pulls you away from the forgiveness. Forgive yourself for your mind for distracting you. Every, every human being has a tendency to be very hard on themselves because we place our expectations very high. And we don't meet those expectations, and then we criticize ourselves. Now, criticizing yourself, one, is unwholesome. That's dwelling on the unwholesome and it causes a lot of pain. And you keep having repeat thoughts over and over again. These repeat thoughts are unwholesome and you're taking them personally and you, you criticize yourself and you, I really blew it and I, I shouldn't have done this and why did I do that? And I should have known better and all of those kind of unwholesome thoughts cause a lot of suffering. And the more you can forgive yourself and stop criticizing yourself because you made a mistake, it might be a mistake that only you see for yourself. 
Nobody else really knows that you, you feel that way. But it keeps this unwholesome nature over and over again. And it causes us to see the world through colored glasses. We don't see things as they actually are. And that's a big problem. That stops our happiness and causes us to get depressed anxious and critical. So we really need to work with forgiveness meditation, which is part of loving kindness. And it helps to relieve that harsh nature that causes emotional upset. The whole point of learning meditation is to learn how to have a mind that is balanced all the time. Too many people think that meditation is only about sitting, but meditation is about living. And the more we can be soft and accepting, and open the more fun there is in life, more acceptance there is in life. We're all going to make mistakes. Everybody makes a mistake every now and then. But that doesn't mean you have to beat yourself up for it. So this kind of loving kindness towards yourself and others means having a balanced mind that doesn't get emotionally upset with whatever happens. It doesn't mean you can't fix the, a problem. You can solve a problem much faster, much easier with a balanced mind and trusting your intuition. Too many people ignore their intuition. They don't follow their intuition. And we have so many um, hindrances and uh, distractions that are very loud voices in our mind. When an intuition comes, we kind of have a tendency to ignore it and go on because of our attachment. We go on in the same way. So Learn to listen to that quiet voice that will tell you, do this, try this, go into this store. There's something that's going to help you there. But also trust your intuition with your forgiveness. Okay. Again, a monk uses things in common with his virtuous companions in the holy life without making reservations. That means generosity and sharing. Monks share everything from food to requisites. We take care of each other. We are a big family. So, he shares with them any grain of kind, any gain of kind that accords with the Dhamma and has, it, has obtained in that way that accords with the Dhamma. 
including even contents in his bowl. There is one um, practice that monks, they make a determination that they're only going to um, eat food that's put in their bowl. Now, this is in, in Asia where they do a lot more alms round than they do in America. But after alms round, there might be five or six monks and we all sit down and eat together. And we know that this monk, he only accepts food that's put into his bowl. But we know that he has certain likes for different kinds of food and it makes him happy. So I would take food out of my bowl and put it in his bowl and then he can eat it because it was accepted in the bowl. And it's, it gets kind of fun during a meal time because we share everything. So the kinds of generosity that we can practice, one of the highest kinds of generosity is sharing your food The Buddha said, if you saw the advantage of sharing your food with others, you would never eat alone. You would always share your food from, from your plate to somebody else's plate. And I had a very good experience with the venerable Munindra when he came to America and then he was at the center that I was working with. And we would sit down to eat and he was constantly taking his food off of his plate and putting it on somebody else's plate because he knew they liked it. And it got to be kind of a tradition while he was there that we would share the food. And it is fun especially sharing with somebody that doesn't have much. Again, monks dwell in public and in private, possessing in common with their companions in the holy life, those virtues unbroken, untorn, unblotched, unmuddled, liberating, commended by the wise, not misapprehended and conducive to constant uh, collectedness. Now we're talking about keeping the, the rules. Keeping the rules of monks. We have a lot of them. We have 227 rules. You have five. And what this is really talking about is showing other people by your actions that keeping the precepts is, it leads to a calm mind. It leads to a happy mind. And it makes life more and more exciting and fun as you keep the, the, precepts for longer and longer periods of time. Again, a monk dwells in public and in private, possessing in common with his companions in the holy life, that view that is noble, emancipating, and leads to practice in accordance with the complete destruction of suffering. Now, one of the things that's a really kind of a strange phenomenon in America is that people that practice meditation, they say they're not supposed to talk to anybody else about it. You don't talk to people about your meditation. Actually, that's a wrong interpretation. 
monks don't talk to laymen about their practice. I have a lot of people that ask me directly, are you an arahat? <coughs> well, I can honestly say, no, I am not. But whether I am an anagami or a saktagami or a sotapanna is none of your business. It's only my business. And I won't talk about where I am with the meditation. For monks, if we start talking about where we are with the meditation, it sounds a little bit, little bit like bragging. And also, it can cause a lot of misunderstanding and criticisms and that sort of thing. So we don't discuss that with laymen, but we do talk about it with other monks. <coughs> Excuse me. But that doesn't mean that laymen can't discuss where they are with their practice among laymen. So it's a very uh, misunderstood form of communication. If you are practicing meditation and you don't have uh, a teacher around, and you run into a problem, then you go to your spiritual friends that are doing the same kind of practice that you're doing and discuss it with them. They can come up with the solutions that you've never thought of before. And you uh, if, if you're at the same level of meditation, then that can be invaluable for you to talk with somebody else that has that same level of understanding. And it's very easy to solve uh, questions. It's very easy to uh, discuss and you can get into some absolutely wonderful discussions on, well, what did you think the Buddha said about this? Here in this sutta it says this, but in this sutta it says that. How, how can you, you uh, find out the common thread? So Dhamma discussions are very good and questions, of course. Like uh, last week, I told you about uh, if you don't ask questions, you're going to be reborn stupid. And when you ask a lot of questions, you're going to be re reborn very intelligent and wise. So any questions that you have, talk to your spiritual friend or talk to a teacher. Don't be shy. That's one of the things that was very difficult for me in uh, when I was in Malaysia, when I was mostly teaching Chinese, and they are taught from the very, very beginning of their life never to question. Don't ask questions. And as a result, they get very confused and trying to get them to talk about what the real problem is, is difficult. Sometimes it takes a long time. 
One of the things about keeping your precepts that's very important is if you have a hindrance, say fear, that is constantly coming up or anxiety, you can't sit still, you always have to be moving. If this sort of thing starts to happen, it's good to talk to your friend, spiritual friend or teacher. Now the nature of keeping things quiet, of not telling somebody, of keeping secrets, means that you have a very strong attachment and it's blocking your going deeper into the meditation. One of the definitions of an arahat is someone that has no secrets. There's no attachment, there's no craving. Secrets cloud the way you see the world. Letting go of those secrets, telling just one other person that secret will clear your mind. It's no longer a secret. So you've let go of the attachment. Sometimes it can be very difficult. There was one lady that <clears throat> she was going through a very difficult time in her life. And she had a secret and I kept on asking her, what, what, what is your secret? Why, why aren't you telling me this? And finally, I pulled out of her, I guess that's a wrong way to describe it, but I convinced her to tell me what her secret was. And her secret was that she was gambling on the internet and she was losing a lot of money and she felt very, very guilty for that. And she was, she, she is sweating on her brow and she was, it was very, very difficult for her to confess to something like that. But once she did, I told her, of course, well, don't get on the internet and do that sort of thing anymore. Don't, don't get caught up in gambling. And immediately her life became much better because she let go of that secret. So keeping secrets, keeping things real private that you might have done that they might not even be that big a deal, but in your mind, you made it a big deal. And you might be really embarrassed because of that. And you then you don't want to tell anybody about it. But when you do, there's a big burden that's taken off your mind and you start seeing things more clearly. So, these are the six memorable qualities that create love and respect and conduce to helpfulness, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Of these six memorable qualities, the highest and most comprehensive, the most conclusive in this view is the noble, emancipating, and leading one to one who practices it in accordance with the complete destruction of suffering. Just as the highest and most comprehensive, the most conclusive part of a pinnacle Building is the pinnacle itself. So to these six memorable qualities are the highest 
in this view that the noble ones talk about emancipating. And how does this view that is noble and emancipating lead to one who practices in accordance with the complete destruction of suffering? Here a monk gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or an empty hut considers thus, is there any obsession unabandoned by myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know and see things as they actually are. Obsess your mind. Think about it a lot. Get caught in it a lot. Keep having repeat thoughts about that obsession. If a monk is obsessed with sensual lust, <coughs> then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by ill will, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed with sloth and torpor, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed with restlessness and remorse, then his mind is obsessed. If he is obsessed by doubt, then his mind is obsessed. Being obsessed with any of the five hindrances is being obsessed. And it means guilty feeling, taking it personally. And it can come from a long time ago in your early life or even before that in other lives. We have these old habitual tendencies. <coughs> when we recognize them as being obsessed, then we need to work with the forgiveness to let go of that obsession. If a monk is absorbed in speculation about this world, then his mind is obsessed. If a monk is absorbed in speculation about other worlds, then his mind is obsessed. If a monk takes to quarreling and brawling and in deep disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, then his mind is obsessed. That means you let go of your thinking and observing mind and just go back over the same old stuff over and over again. He understands thus, there's no obsession unabandoned in myself that might obsess my mind that I cannot know and see things as they actually are. My mind is well disposed for awakening to truths. This is the first knowledge attained by him that is noble, supramundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, when I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, do I personally obtain serenity? Do I personally obtain quenching, letting go, relief? That's what it's talking about here. He understands when I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, I personally obtain serenity. I personally obtain quenching. This is the second knowledge attained by him that is noble, supramundane. Supramundane means beyond the mundane. Mundane means everyday life. 
super mundane means the spiritual life. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, is there any other recluse or Brahmin outside the Buddha's dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess? <coughs> Why is that such a, a big statement? A view that only the Buddhist really work towards and, and obtain. It is because of the seeing the impersonal nature of everything, not taking things personally. Now, when you, when you do that, you are leading the spiritual life at that time. When you recognize that you're holding on to a view that has anger or restlessness in it. And you see how much it causes you pain and you use the six R's and let it go. There's great relief in that. He understands thus, there's no other recluse or Brahmin outside the Buddha's dispensation possessed of this view. It's all very confusing because a lot of people really have a belief in a permanent soul, a permanent self. They're looking for something that's always permanent. And everything is in a state of change. And seeing the impersonal nature of that there is great relief and your mind becomes very uh, peaceful and calm when you recognize that. This is the third knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although he may commit some kind of offense, break a precept for which a means of rehabilitation has been laid down. The rehabilitation is letting go of the secrets, telling a spiritual friend or teacher so that you can let go of that guilty feeling. Still, he at once confesses, reveals, and discloses it to a teacher or a wise companion in the holy life. And having done that, he enters upon restraint for the future. Oh, I, I've told a lot of people about this. Uh, forgive yourself for making a mistake if there's no spiritual friend or teacher around. Take the precepts again and make a strong determination that you're not going to do that in the future. Just as a young tender infant lying prone at, at once draws back when he puts his hand or foot in a fire or a live coal so too, that is the character of a person who possesses right view. Breaking a precept causes guilty feeling. <clears throat> and it will keep coming up. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. It'll keep coming up until you let go of that secret of having done that. He understands th thus, I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. 
This is the fourth knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although he may be active in various matters for his companions in the holy life, yet he has a keen regard for training in the higher virtue, training in the higher mind, training in the higher wisdom. Always uh, thinking and training yourself so you can see how dependent origination works, how loving kindness works, how any of the Brahma Viharas work. Always being aware of what you're doing before you do it. When you keep the precepts over a period of time, you start seeing that much more clearly and then you have to make a choice whether you're gonna break that precept or not. Hopefully you won't break the precept, but if you happen to, you're going to have a guilty mind and it's going to come back at you with your meditation. It's going to come back and cause you all kinds of problems. Just as a cow with a new calf, while she gazes, watches her calf, so too, that is the character of a person who possesses right view. That means being aware of what you're doing while you're doing it. He understands thus, I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. This is the fifth knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. <clears throat> Again, a noble disciple considers thus, I do possess, do, do I possess strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he heeds it, gives it attention, engages it with all his mind, hears the Dhamma as with eager ears. Oh, listening to the Dhamma, I, I know that some people, they say, well, I'm going to, I have this project I have to do, and I'll just turn on the Dhamma talk and listen to the Dhamma talk while I'm doing that. Well, that does not really give you much benefit. The way you listen to a Dhamma talk with high respect and only listen to the Dhamma. Don't be doing other things. I know that sometimes people, they like to listen to the Dhamma while they're preparing a meal or cooking or doing a, a hobby or whatever. They, they get very little advantage of doing this. It's when you sit down, give it high respect and listen completely, only listening. He understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the sixth knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, 
Do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dhamma and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, he gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dhamma, gains gladness connected with the Dhamma. When you listen very attentively to a Dhamma talk, especially if it's read to you from the suttas, you can, uh, you can be really happy because your understanding is improved every time you're attentive with a Dhamma talk. I listen to a lot of Dhamma talks. I, I give a lot of Dhamma talks. And there are some people that can even attain, uh, be, become a sotapanna by just listening and understanding what is being said, by listening and readjusting your um, observations and perspective just by listening to the Dhamma talks. He understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the seventh knowledge attained by him that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. When this noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, he has well sought the character for realization of the fruit of stream entry. When an adult and a noble disciple is thus possessed of these seven factors, he possesses the fruit of stream entry. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. I particularly like this sutta because it, it, it spells out what to do in case there is disagreement between people and how to handle that with loving kindness with loving kindness in body, speech, and mind. Not letting your mind run off and think about this and that and how this person is wrong and they shouldn't say this and how they're trying to cause problems and all of that. When you take the time to radiate loving kindness to those people, eventually they will uh, be more easily communicated with. One of the interesting things, Joseph, Stok uh, Joseph Goldstein was telling about a story when he was with Manindra in India and there was this guy that was extremely rude to everybody that came around him. He always had something nasty to say. Except when he saw Munindra. He was always very kind and loving and soft-spoken around Manindra. So Joseph asked him one day, why is he like that to you and everybody else? He's really nasty. What is it that you have that nobody else has? 
And Menendra told him that he's been spending some period of time radiating loving kindness to him every time he thought about him, every time he had any dealings with him. The man sold peanuts. That was the way he made his living. But he was always so nasty to people, he didn't have many customers. But when more and more people started hearing about Manindra and what he was doing, uh, the man became more and more able to communicate in nice ways without being offensive. And he actually began to prosper more and more as he calmed down because Menindra was telling other people how to, how to act around this offensive man. Before long, he had a reputation, this man had a reputation of being kind and gentle. And it all started with Manindra not believing that nastiness, not getting upset by his uh, verbal attacks, but having compassion for that man and other people seeing him as the example found out what he was doing and they started doing that and that changed that man's attitude. He still had his moments of dissatisfaction and dislike, but they were less and less and his offensiveness became less and less. This is how you become an example to the world around you by remembering to radiate loving kindness to people that are especially nasty and problematic. Don't take it personally because there's nothing in the world that's personal. Radiate loving kindness and compassion to as many people as you possibly can in the day. And by your example, other people will follow that example. And that's how we change the world around us in a positive way. So I've been talking for a while do any of you have any questions either about your practice or just general questions? Hmm. Even though I tell you that if you don't ask questions, you're going to wind up stupid, it doesn't seem to matter. That's what um, you're going to get for yourself. Fine, you can do that. I have a question, please. Oh, please do. Um, I'm encountering a lot of um, restlessness. Okay. And I can hardly sit still. And I cannot sometimes not sleep at night because I'm so restless. And I'm trying to let it go. But it is... Uh, Okay. I, I can let it go. Here's what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. I want you to ask yourself, what is the cause of the restlessness? You ask yourself that while you're sitting. Okay. And your intuition will come and tell you what the problem is. And then you can adjust and you won't have so much problem with restlessness after that. Okay, trust your intuition. Mm -hmm. okay. And it might be that you need to switch your meditation from loving kindness over to forgiveness and forgive yourself for making mistakes and things like that. 
but first try with your intuition to see what your intuition says. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. And let me know how it goes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yeah, it's okay. Um, yes. Regarding forgiveness meditation, um, I do it if something comes up during meditation. I find it very effective and very helpful. Would it be perhaps a good idea just to maybe set aside a separate meditation, even if I'm not feeling something in needs of forgiving, just sort of a, a cultivation of forgiveness meditation, if well, that makes sense. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one of the things that's very helpful to me. I, I would always have some kind of fantastic idea that I needed to think about and consider while I was sitting in meditation. And... I, I put a red flag on it and told myself, I don't need to think about it right now. It can come up later when I'm not sitting. And it, it worked. Now, as far as the doing the forgiveness, the fastest way to do forgiveness is to only do forgiveness. Okay. Let go of any other practice that you're doing and just stay with the forgiveness. That's the fastest way to overcome these kind of things. And don't get caught up in the story of why you need to forgive or what that other person did to cause that problem. Don't get caught up in the story. Your job is just to stay with, I forgive you for causing me pain, or I forgive myself for causing the pain. Okay, or I, for, I forgive myself for not understanding. There's a lot of the problems that we have. We didn't understand the whole problem. We just reacted to whatever it was. And we have to forgive ourselves for that. Okay? Did that help? Very much, yes. Thank you. Okay, good. That makes me happy. <laughs> I have a question, please. Yes. Auntie, nice to see you. Um, I've um, been continuing to do forgiveness meditation um, pretty well nonstop, and I do it through the day. It's really changed my life and my heart. Um, and I'm, I'm finding that um, I'm trying to forget. I have some couple very difficult family members, like it's just, very abusive, very, very different. And I find that I, I just don't feel I can deal with them. And I'm just continuously forgiving myself for not being able to respond, for not being able to do the right thing to help them to, and I, and, and I, I've just let go of trying to change the other person completely. And just, right. I just keep finding that all I'm doing is forgiving myself. I, I don't feel like I can forgive them. They're, they're just themselves. It's nothing to do with me. I'll tell you a, a story that might help. Okay. <laughs> I had a student that when she was 16, her father committed suicide. Mm -hmm. It was from a very rich family. And right after he committed suicide, the uncle stole the, the family fortune. Mm -hmm. Now, cut back another 35 years, and she comes and she starts practicing meditation with me, and she told me about the situation and how she hates her uncle. So I told her that she needed to start forgiving. And she did. 
and she felt a lot of relief. And when she got home after the retreat, one of the first things that happened was her uncle, who had stole the family fortune, called her up and asked her to forgive him for doing that. Now, all she did was forgive him for causing that much pain. And when he called up and asked her to forgive him, then they worked out a lot of the problems that they'd had with each other. You're not trying to change somebody else by forgiving them. What you're doing is changing your perspective of them. How do you do it without having the little you hook see, there? You see them in your mind's eye and you say, I forgive you for causing this pain. I forgive you for not understanding. Don't get into the story. Just keep your mind on forgiving. So there's as, just a, a little thing there. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. I don't want to do that. <laughs> as, as you forgive them, you're opening up your perspective of them. And that allows them the space to change. Right now, when you, when you have non-forgiveness, when you have this uh, grudge, you always think of them in the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now with the forgiveness, this means acceptance. You stop thinking of them in that way and your psychic energy changes towards them, and that allows, us, allows them to change. It might not be the change you necessarily would like to see, but it allows them the space to change, and eventually there will be some relief in that. I know I've done that and it's really been powerful with another family member uh -huh. um, and that's in, it's connected with the other person and uh -huh. and it's been powerful there's been big movement just in the last few weeks but I I very the difficulty is for me the, the hearing that story and thinking oh if I do this I'll get something out of it I you know uh, I'll get what I want Absolutely. from it you have to wait and see what you're going to get. You don't know. You can't tell the future. I know, but I do have a way. When it's, you don't know when it's going to happen or how mm -hmm. it's going to happen, but there will be some lightening of the feeling towards them. I just have to trust that <laughs> yes. and have a lot of patience, man. That's magnificent. <laughs> Thank you. Please, please continue on with that. <laughs> I have to. There's nothing else I can do. <laughs> right. There will be relief, I promise you. Thank At you. some point. I don't know when it's going to happen. It depends on your attachment to them and what they say and their attachment to you. There's a complicated mess. But it's a simple solution. Mm -hmm. Okay? Thank you. Okay. I love your smile. <laughs> Very good. Uh, uh, thanks to you, everybody's saying, oh, you're smiling all the time. Looks good. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me happy. <laughs> it feels better. <laughs> yeah. All life becomes more fun. <clears throat> Anybody else have a question? Yes, thank you, Bante, for your talk. Um, <clears throat> for, thank you for your Dhamma talk. I have a question about practice. Is it okay to um, start off 
your daily practice with forgiveness meditation and then let it move to metta? No. Um, do one thing at a time. If you want to do forgiveness, stay with forgiveness until you feel relief. Then when you go back to metta, your metta is going to be really strong. Because this is a form of metta. Right. But just, okay. just do one thing at a time. That way you won't get confused and jump from one thing to the other when it gets tough and that sort of thing. You got to stick with it. Okay. okay. Thank you. It's helpful. You're welcome. Any other questions? Hello, Bante. Hello. Hi, yes. Uh, nice to have you. Yeah. Every week. <laughs> yeah, Bante, I have also like uh, one, uh, uh, actually uh, more than one is several, like uh, previous uh, uh, actions or deeds that that was when I was uh, in previous years that was uh, obviously is uh, breaking precepts and uh, that keep coming back some scenario when even though when I was very young, I remember certain things that I did. Right now, I know it is very very bad, you know, like, uh, and then over the years, um, that means I still have to do a lot of forgiveness, right? Because that yeah. scenario is from time to time. To comes. Mistakes. You have to give it until you accept it and say, okay, I did that. It's gone. Now I feel relief and it will stop coming back to you. It keeps repeating itself because of your attachment to it. So that means I still need uh, to in practice uh, forgiveness. Don't get involved in the story okay. of how it happened, why it happened. We don't care about that. All you have to do is forgive yourself for doing it. Forgive yourself because you made a mistake. You've learned from the mistake. You're not going to do that again, right? So, Sorry. forgive yourself. But just stay with the forgiveness. The story about why and how and all of this stuff is already gone. It's past. You don't have to repeat it. You know what happened. What you need to do is just stay with the forgiveness. Okay. Um, so, okay. Um, I, I, I actually practice uh, like uh, several times and I feel relief, but still there is like uh, other scenarios, like for some scenarios, mm -hmm. even though for the biggest hindrance that I think I have, I was like able to see myself overcome, even though, I mean, even through a very uh, like direct practice of like uh, talking to those persons that we have had problems with directly, which I was feeling big reliefs. But then uh, when, with some other people or some other things and scenarios in the previous older days, which I wasn't had chance to close it, that still comes up. That means I still need more forgiveness to myself. You because have, to, it, get, you have to keep forgiving until you feel relief. Okay. When you feel relief, they have, they're not there. your mind will tell you, well, I don't have to do that anymore. Now I really did forgive. See, okay. the whole thing with forgiveness, of repeating the statements over and over and over again, is convince your mind that you're being serious with it and you want to let go of that attachment. That's what forgiveness is. It's repeating it until you convince yourself that you can let that go. You can let that, that guilty feeling go. You can let that pain go. You still will have memory of what happened in the past, but the pain won't be there anymore. That's forgiveness, and that is extremely powerful. 
Mm -hmm. I can still continue on matter, right? If I feel like that uh, after the forgiveness, the other like sitting or the other next day, which I can see myself in a mode or mood that uh, there is and not. What, what did I just get through? I mean, it's on and else? off. What did I just get through huh? somebody else? Do one thing at a time. Only do one thing. Don't do the matter. Yeah. The forgiveness yeah. is a kind of metta. Stay with that until you're done with it. Okay. Okay. okay Let understand. go of the so, other. Yeah. The metta will be there whenever you get done with the forgiveness. It'll be there stronger okay. and easier. But we want to wrap hard-hearted feelings around your heart. We want to let those feelings go so they don't bother you anymore. Okay? Thank you, Bhante. Thank you. Okay. Smile. <laughs> Anybody else with a question? No? No, I have one more question. Okay. I would just want to say that I know that I have this restlessness um, ever since I can remember. Even as a child, it has always been there. But now it's strong. Well, don't get over concerned with it. Don't turn it into a big deal. Just forgive it for being there. Okay. It can be from something that occurred in a past lifetime. Who knows? But you, it, the forgiveness works. Okay. When you clear it up here in the present, it won't come back to bother you from the past. Okay? Even if I don't know what it is. Even if you don't know what it is. Just forgive yourself for not understanding. Okay. Okay, then let's share some merit. <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share the mer this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I wish you all a very happy week and I'll see you next Sunday. Thank, Thank you, Bonte. Have you, a good Bonte. week. Yeah. Thank you, Bonte.